Chapter 8, the 11th of January, 355 days to go. Crookwood Cemetery, First Avenue, Crookwood, 12.28am. Bogus and I crept through the gloom, passing the tall cypress trees that lined the cemetery's walls. Clouds scudded across the sky, blocking the moonlight so that once we turned down the road leading to the cemetery gates, we had to find our way with the narrow beams of light from our mobile phones. I have to say, this is not my idea of fun, said Bogus. It's not about fun. It's about getting into Rafe's secret storage box. This cemetery raid was at least taking my mind off what I'd found at home earlier. Once we get hold of those drawings, I said, I'm sure we'll have a better idea of what Dad found out in Ireland. Right, that's if the ghouls don't get us first. The gates were closed, but we scaled them easily enough, although I had to help Bogus haul himself over. We dropped onto the other side and crept low in the dark. I hoped no one had seen us and we hadn't been picked up by any surveillance cameras. OK, I said. No one around. Let's go quietly down to the vault and check it out. And then let's get the hell out of here. This place gives me the creeps. I was with Bogus on that. In the gloom, the marble columns and angels formed ghostly figures around us. Hey, what's that? Bogus hissed, suddenly grabbing my arm. I didn't hear anything. Listen. I did, standing still. After about 15 seconds of silence, I gave Bogus a shove. Come on, you're spooked, that's all. We were almost at the Ormond Vault. I could see its bulk in the cold light of the moon, which was suddenly sailing brightly above, freed for the moment from the heavy cloud. We hurried over, climbed the couple of steps to the front door. Bogus shone his mobile light onto the lock while I twisted the key in it. The door loudly creaked open. We listened, afraid security might have heard something, and then squeezed through the opening. The air was musty, cold and very still. I'd better wait here, in case anyone comes, whispered Bogus. He was a smart guy, but his gran had told him far too many crazy Ukrainian ghost stories. I guided the beam of light around the four shelves in the front section until it fell on the carved wooden box that Mum had bought. Hi, Dad, I whispered just here to pick up the drawings you wanted me to have. And then I directed the light onto the plastic storage container on the floor, squatting beside it, clicking open the handles. I found the drawings straight away. They were sitting right on top of everything. I didn't even look at what else was in there. I just grabbed them. My excitement mounted as I lifted them out. I was aware that Bogus had crept in and was peering over my shoulder, curiosity overcoming his concern about spooks. I looked at the first one. It was the angel again, the Ormond angel. Let's get out of here. Grab them and go, said Bogus. I folded them carefully and stashed them in my backpack. This is not a cool place to hang out, Bogus said, as he cautiously shone his mobile into the dark recesses of the vault, revealing the stairs to the lower chamber. I didn't know it had another level. He took a couple of hesitant steps further into the mausoleum as I stood up. Looks full up down there, he said. That's right, all the really old coffins from generations ago had stored down there. Come on, we've got what we came for, let's get out of here. 1.43am. Bogus went home, leaving me with the drawings. Now I was searching for somewhere to hide, safe from prying eyes. I wanted to find a place to stash the drawings and grab some sleep. All my life I'd taken so much for granted. Right now I'd have done anything to be in my bedroom at home. 3.51am. I wandered the streets for ages, avoiding eye contact with everyone and keeping well away from any police, until I found myself outside a row of old houses. Dumps now, but probably mansions in their day. One of the biggest houses at the far end I had noticed had been adapted into a backpacker hostel. Many blocks down the road, and when I was so tired from walking I thought I'd just curl up under a tree like a cat, I noticed a for sale sign attached to number 38 a semi-derelict mansion with a very overgrown front yard. I took a closer look. The windows downstairs were boarded up and the front door had strong planks diagonally nailed across it. It seemed deserted. I crept up quietly to the front door and around the veranda. One of the side windows wasn't fully covered by timber and I was able to get my hands around the lowest piece and after a struggle, prise it free. No one could see me there on the side veranda of the old place. It took a while, but once I had the first piece of timber off, the other bits came away more easily. I climbed inside, dragging my backpack through behind me. 
When my eyes got used to the darkness, I could just make out old-fashioned wallpaper stained and discoloured hanging off the walls of the room. Cracks of light from the street lamp outside helped me see that two old broken chairs leaned against the front wall and dirty old newspapers littered the floor. In one corner there had been a staircase, but it had rotted and all that remained of it were a few steps going nowhere against the wall. The rest was a pile of broken timber collapsed beneath them. I didn't want to explore any of the dark areas until daylight. They were probably full of rats. It was a miserable place, neglected, alone and falling apart. But it would do for now. I sat down and messaged Bogus on his secret mobile with the address, reminding him to bring along the things I'd asked for. Then I curled up in one corner and fell asleep. The Hideout, 38 St John Street, 11.04am Someone was trying to get in the front door. Jolted awake with panic, I skulked over to the door and squinted through a crack. Thank God it was only Bogus. I whispered to him to come round to the side of the house. He handed me a computer bag and climbed in through the window, looking around. This place is pretty cool, for a dump. He walked around, carefully feeling his way, suspicious of the sagging floorboards. There's a hole here, he called out. It goes right underneath the house. I came over to see. Lucky I hadn't fallen through there last night when I was creeping around. I put my head down and looked in. I could see that some of the stone and brick piles that supported the house and a whole world of spiderwebs and dust. Hey, the water's still on in the bathroom, Bogus called out as I lifted up my head again, hearing the sound of a flushing toilet. Wish I'd known that last night, I said. I carefully made my way over the floorboards to join him in what remained of the bathroom. The sink was broken and the shower head was missing, but the stained toilet still flushed. Bogus turned a tap on and rusty brown water dribbled to the floor. I could get a bucket and put it under the sink and wash under what was left of the shower pipe. Man, you wouldn't believe the hysteria you've caused, said Bogus. We were sitting at the back on the small veranda overlooking the tangle of vines and bushes that filled the yard. My mum won't quit hassling me about it. It's been on the news again and look here. He pulled his mobile and passed it to me. I snatched it. That's what he could see. Missing schoolboy wanted for attacks. Police are searching for Callum Ormond, 15, of Richmond. Ormond, who disappeared last night after a vicious attack on his uncle and younger sister, is wanted for questioning. Great, I said, handing the mobile back. I've always wanted to get my name in the headlines. Even Mr Lee from school was on the news, said Bogus. He was banging on about how you'd always been popular, a good kid and a good student, and that he was shocked and devastated to hear you were involved in the attacks. And then Susie Miller jumped in beside him and said something like, Yeah, me and Cal dated in like year eight and I feel so lucky that the relationship like ended when it did. It could have turned real ugly. Bogus laughed. She's the only thing that turned real ugly. What can I say? The situation was ridiculous. I couldn't believe that I was going to have to convince my mum that I had nothing to do with what had happened. Bogus brought me some more food and drinks. Water, bread, a few tins of baked beans, some chips and chocolate rations. I grabbed a bag of chips and pulled the drawings out of my backpack, spreading them out on the floor. Your dad sure could draw, said Bogus after a while. Look, he said, another angel. And you'll have to wait until tomorrow to find out what else they find in the drawings. See you then.